Hey everyone, welcome to section 3.1, Decentralized Consensus and Blockchains. Uh, let's jump right in. So at the end of chapter 2, we had this proof of authority network, and the big idea behind decentralized consensus is rather than having a single authority node tell everyone what transaction they should include next, we have rounds, and people can take turns in each round being this authority node. So if we look at this spinner, we can sort of represent this idea as having everyone having an equal chance of getting picked by this spinner. And whoever gets picked is a one-time authority node who gets to propose the next state transition everyone should apply to their state. So let's walk through the life cycle of a transaction in this system. So let's say Alice wants to send $100 to Mallory. So Alice will create the transaction. Alice will order it with her nonce and sign that transaction put it in a packet, and send that packet to all of her peers. Mallory will receive the transaction, uh, will verify that the signature is valid, and will add it to this collection of transactions in a transaction pool, which is really just a set of pending transactions that are, you know, they're all valid transactions, but no authority node has declared that these transactions should be included in everyone's state yet. So Jing will receive the transaction, verify the signature, and will add it to her transaction pool until everyone has received it. Now in an asynchronous environment, some people might not receive the same transactions and everyone's transaction pool might be a little bit different. But this is actually okay because a transaction is not really confirmed until an authority node has proposed that it be included in history. So in the first round, we'll spin the spinner and in this case, Jing got picked. So Jing will get her temporary authority crown, uh, will select a transaction out of her transaction pool to be the very first transaction in history. We'll order it as the first transaction, and we'll sign it with her authority signature. Now Jing has that transaction in her history, and we'll send this history to everyone, and everyone will verify that it has a valid authority signature, and we'll add it to their ledger. And everyone will remove that transaction from their transaction pool because it's no longer valid. Now in the next round, we'll spin the spinner again, and this time Bob gets picked. Uh, he gets the authority crown, and he will pick a transaction from his transaction pool to include next. Uh, he'll order it with a nonce of one uh, as the second transaction, and he will sign it with his temporary authority crown. He'll throw it into a packet, and then he'll propagate it to the rest of the network. Now everyone will verify his signature on that second transaction, and they will all add it to their history. Now again, we spin the spinner, and this round, Alice is the lucky winner. So Alice gets to have the temporary authority crown and add the next transaction in history and sign it with her authority signature. And of course, Alice will propagate that to everyone. Everyone will verify it and add it to their history. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but is this censorship resistant? Is this reversion resistant? And is this scalable, right? Does this actually work in practice? Um, so we'll start by answering scalable, but we'll actually address all of these problems with the same solution. If we're doing, say, one of these rounds per 10 minutes, because we want all of the messages to finish propagating before we start a new round, uh, that gives us one transaction every 10 minutes. Uh, it's pretty clear that that is unusable in any setting. Um, so the first step in making this system more scalable is rather than having every authority just proposing one transaction to include, they can include multiple transactions. So maybe something on the order of thousands of transactions per round uh, that they put in what's called a block. And the authority, which is right now Alice, will hash that block of transactions and will order that block and sign the hash of that block. So Alice will add that block to her ledger and will send that block to everyone to verify. And everyone will verify that, you know, the authority signature checks out with the hash of the block. And we have everyone in consensus. Now we'll have another round, and this round Mallory is the authority node. Uh, so Mallory is sneaky and wants to double spend on this network. So the first block has an ordering nonce of zero and Mallory will look into her transaction pool and will throw together a, a new block. But rather than including this transaction of her sending money to Jing, we'll replace it with a transaction of her sending money to herself. Mallory will of course hash that block and order it as the next block with an ordering nonce of one and will sign that hash of the block as well as an authority node. But the sneaky part is that Mallory will keep this block private and not send it to everyone. 
now when Bob gets picked, uh, Bob will take some transactions and Bob will order his block with an ordering nonce of one, uh, being the second block, and he will add the hash of the block and sign that hash with the authority crown. Then, of course, he'll add the block to his history and send that block to everyone else to verify. But what's interesting is as soon as Mallory receives Bob's block, she'll verify that it's actually the second block, and she'll see that it includes the transaction of her spending $100 to Jing uh, with a knots of one, and Mallory will add her altered block, which has a different transaction of her spending $100 to herself with a nonce of one. And Mallory will send out that different block to everyone. Now, Alice will receive Mallory's block first, will verify that it was signed with an authority node signature, and will add this changed block to her history. So now, although everyone's first block is the same, everyone's second block is different. Mallory and Alice think that Mallory's transaction with a nonce of one is Mallory sending $100 to herself. Uh, but Bob and Jing think that Mallory's transaction with a nonce of one is sending $100 to Jing. So Mallory has just successfully double spent on Jing. And we'll see that, you know, even if we have a new round and Jing gets picked and Jing adds a new block, um, everyone can add that block safely even though they all have a different version of history. So that different history that Mallory and Alice have added to their ledger will always be there. So Mallory's double spend is successful. Alice still thinks that Mallory has that $100, but Jing and Bob think that that $100 transaction went through. And so the big problem here is that there is no dependency between one block and the block before it. Everyone was able to accept that third block even though they all have different versions of history for the second block. We can solve this by introducing hash pointers, which is really just a pointer to some data along with a hash of that data so that data can't be altered. So let's run through an example. Alice goes through her transaction pool, takes her transactions, and adds them to a block. Alice will hash that block, but instead of just signing the hash of the transactions, Alice will hash the transactions together with the previous block hash. Now, this previous block hash is just a bunch of zeros because this is the first block, the Genesis block, and there is no previous block. Now, Alice will hash those two together in order to get the block hash of the first block. So Alice will just add that block hash to the block and will sign it as the authority for this first round. Now you might notice that there is no ordering nonce. Uh, the ordering is just implicit in which previous block hash was used. Uh, so in having a hash pointer to this zero hash, we know that this is the first block in history. So Alice will add this block to history and will send the block as a packet to everyone else in the network. And everyone will verify the block and add it to their ledger. And of course, now everyone is in consensus. And this time, Bob gets picked. So Bob will take some transactions from his transaction pool, will throw it in a block, and will hash this block of transactions together with the previous block hash. So let's take a look into this first block. We see that the block hash uh, that Alice had was E770. So we'll hash this block hash together with all of the transactions. And this gives us a new hash. 0 B C. So Bob will add this block hash to the block and will sign it as the authority node. And now we have this dependency. So the validity of Bob's block depends on Alice's block staying the same. So Bob will propagate this second block and everyone will accept it and everyone will be in consensus. Now, if we fast forward a little bit, everyone now has four blocks in their history. Uh, they're all connected through hash pointers. And Mallory has a block that she is keeping secret. Mallory gets picked and Mallory says it's time to double spend. So Mallory will add a fifth block in history and Mallory will replace the first block with her own 
separate block that she had signed earlier. And the big difference is that she has changed this transaction where she had previously sent $100 to Bob, the transaction with a nonce of zero, uh, into a transaction of her sending $100 to herself. You'll see also that the block hashes are obviously different because the contents of the block are different. So Mallory will replace that first block with her own block and will throw that whole chain into a packet and tell everyone this is the correct history. Alice will receive this different set of blocks and will have to verify that these changes are valid. So we have this second block uh, that was signed by Bob and we have this first block that is uh, replaced Alice with a block that has been signed by Mallory. Now, Alice's software just has to verify that if you hash the transactions from Bob's block together with this changed block hash from Mallory, uh, that it has the same block hash that Bob signed. But we'll see that this block hash that we just computed, 0x9ce, is different from the hash that Bob signed, which was 0bc. So Bob didn't sign this, so it's not a valid block hash, and Alice rejects this whole set of blocks. So it's clear that the dependency that every block has on its previous block means that you can't change a block that happened very far in the past, because all of the blocks on top of it rely on it being the same because of this hash pointer. So the double spend was foiled. Sorry, Mallory. So let's take a look at the same attack that we had earlier, but now we've added hash pointers. So everyone agrees on the very first block, uh, but everyone disagrees on this second block. You know, Mallory has kept this block secret and has propagated it to just Alice. So Alice and Mallory both think that Mallory sent $100 to herself, uh, but Bob and Jing think Mallory sent that money to Jing. So let's play this out. So the spinner spins and the next round's authority is Jing. So Jing will add a new block with a dependency on her second block and will propagate that message to everyone. Bob will add that block with no problem. When Mallory receives that chain of blocks, she'll see that there is what's called a fork. Either she chooses these two blocks that were uh, created by Jing and Bob or she chooses this block that she had signed. Um, and the default in this protocol, uh, there's different what are called fork choice rules, but the default in Bitcoin is that the longest chain is always the chain that wins. So uh, if Mallory is being honest, then Mallory will have to choose the longest blockchain. And she probably should because everyone is going to, including Alice, who sees that, okay, there's a longer chain, uh, I'm going to pick that over the one that I had seen previously. So Alice is going to discard Mallory's block and will accept this new history. So we have foiled this double spend by adding hash pointers. So now that Mallory knows that she can't just change some transactions and blocks that happened in the past, let's see what happens when she tries to execute a double spend attack. So the spinner spins and Jing is the authority of the first round. So Jing will add a block and send it to everyone and everyone will agree that this block is the first block in history. Then Mallory gets picked and Mallory will try to execute a double spend. So Mallory will create a new first block that probably replaces one of the transactions that she had included in Jing's block and changes it to either spending it to herself or spending it to a different person. So now Bob gets picked. Bob will add a block to history. Bob gets lucky, gets picked again, adds another block to history. Uh, Alice gets picked, and Alice adds a block to history. And then Mallory gets picked again, and Mallory will add a block that has a hash pointer to her double spending first block. Now Alice gets lucky, and Alice gets to add a new block to now Jing gets picked and Jing adds a block to this longest chain. Uh, and then Bob gets picked. Bob adds a new block to the longest chain. And Alice gets picked again. Alice adds a block to the longest chain. And then Mallory gets picked and Mallory adds a block to her fork. 
And what we'll see is because three quarters of our participants are agreeing on the longest chain and Mallory is off doing her own thing, we'll see that all the transactions in the first block have eight confirmations, meaning the first confirmation is when it's included in a block and second confirmation is when a new block is uh, built on top of it, a new block that has a hash pointer to that block third confirmation when a new block gets built on top of that one and, and so on and so forth. And because there's so many confirmations on this longest chain, uh, the chances of Mallory catching up at this point is is very low, less than 5%. Um, even if Mallory, you know, keeps building blocks on top of her shorter chain forever. What we have here is called probabilistic finality. There is no 100% guarantee that the transactions in the longest chain right now uh, will be in the longest chain in the end. But we can say with very, very high probability that the longer the longest chain gets than the fork of a malicious actor trying to double spend, then the lower chance there is of that transaction in the longest chain getting reverted. And we owe this all to having this chain of blocks, these blocks that all have hash pointer dependencies on one another, so you can't change history without changing everything that happened after it. Um, we call this the blockchain. There's a lot of hype around this term, uh, but really all it is is this data structure of a list of blocks that are connected through these hash pointers. And each block has a dependency on the block that came before it. So this model would be perfect if we were able to assure that each person only got one vote. Uh, but this model of having this spinner with everyone having an equal chance of getting picked isn't actually very practical. Uh, so we'll talk about what innovation Satoshi Nakamoto introduced in the Bitcoin protocol, which was introduced in 2008, which uses proof of work to pick the next authority in each round in a fair way. And also what's preventing Mallory from saying, hey guys, like I'll pay you a couple bucks or like I'll be your friend if you just don't follow the protocol and mine on my shorter chain. So in order to prevent this, we need incentives for honest behavior. So we need people to be making more money if they're honest and they mine on the longer chain. And we need penalties for bad behavior, meaning we need people to lose money if they do intentionally malicious things like mining on a shorter chain in order to revert history for a double spend to go through. And we'll be covering those two aspects, uh, proof of work and the incentives of the Bitcoin protocol in Nakamoto consensus section 3.2 uh, so stay tuned <laughs>